You are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we have created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook recordings of stories that have appeared in our magazine. And our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you went over to check it out. I'm Roberta, your narrator and story editor at After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com slash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audiobook reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media and suggest it to friends. Today's story is Step Back written by Henry McFarland and published in our June 2021 magazine. Step Back by Henry McFarland Beth never liked doctors' offices. The white sterile surfaces, the antiseptic smell, the degree pretentiously hung on the wall. Bob's gently putting his hand on hers was comforting, but she still hated the waiting. Finally, Dr. Wilkins strode in, all brisk efficiency, and sat behind her desk. Good news, Mrs. Stevens. Your nausea doesn't stem from anything serious. You've conceived in utero, inside your body. That means Beth's hands went to her belly. She had long dreamed of this. A child lived inside her. That's wonderful. Bob reached over and hugged his wife. The two shared a long kiss before he spoke. We hoped you'd say that. Our first child. Excellent. The doctor's smile looked practiced. I'm glad you're both pleased. Now it's a simple procedure to draw the embryo from where it's embedded in your uterus, and we can recommend some fine womb farms to nurture it until it's ready to go home as your child. Beth had expected such nonsense. She had dreamed of this moment for years, and no one would ruin it for her. Doctor, we'll leave our child where she is. That's how people procreated for thousands of years, isn't it? A frown furrowed on the dark skin of Dr. Wilkins' brow. I wouldn't recommend that. The old method could lead to serious complications. Also, genetic enhancements are much harder in a natural womb. Many are actually impossible. Beth reminded herself to stay calm. Complications are possible either way. I don't want those so-called enhancements. Babies are designed to look like everyone else. Even babies without gender. Those aren't enhancements. The doctor's voice sounded reproving, irritated. I'm not suggesting you do those things, but were a genetic illness to arise, we might not be able to deal with it in an internal pregnancy. Our families don't have a history of genetic illness, so I don't see why you raise that issue, doctor. It's my choice, and I'm going to carry this baby the way nature intended. Wilkins sighed in resignation. Mrs. Stevens, this practice does not treat internal pregnancy. The only obstetrician still practicing that method around here is Dr. Pearson. I'll refer you to him. Dr. Pearson could see them the next day. His office was on the lower level of an older building on the outskirts of downtown. Dust danced in the sunlight that streamed from the small windows near the ceiling, and his office had a musty smell, likely from the old medical books that filled the cases along the walls. That didn't matter to Beth. His shock of gray hair showed he had lots of experience, and she loved his manner. He gave her and Bob a big smile. Mrs. Stevens is young and in superb health, an excellent candidate for internal pregnancy. It's great that you two won't mindlessly conform to how other people have babies today. Beth was euphoric. A baby within her was all she wanted, and she knew the next few months would be great. She watched her nutrition very carefully. Still, she'd wake up with her stomach feeling queasy. Eating a few bland crackers helped sometimes, but other times she'd kneel next to the toilet and throw up. On a few days, the nausea lasted so long that she missed work. One day, her supervisor called her to a conference room where a man from human resources waited. 
Beth disliked the HR guy on sight. He looked cadaverous, skinny and pale, as if he had never been outside. He cleared his throat and started talking. Ms. Stevens, your position requires a high degree of reliability. You have to be here when we need you. Because of the internal pregnancy, we can't count on you. Thus, we no longer require your services. Of course, we'll pay a two-week severance. Beth called Bob at his work and told him of her firing and shouted, They can't do that to me. I'm going to find a lawyer and sue. They set up an appointment with a lawyer, an older woman, someone recommended. Her office was on one of the highest floors of a downtown skyscraper. She sat attentively behind a wide, empty desk as Beth told her story. When Beth finished, the attorney cleared her throat. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I can't recommend that you bring a suit. Beth couldn't believe it. Firing someone for getting pregnant is illegal. It was, Mrs. Stevens, but when the internal pregnancy became rare, those laws were weakened. Your former employee can simply say your condition makes you unreliable, and unreliability is valid grounds for a discharge. Beth sat there stunned. The lawyer went on. It's not too late to switch to a womb farm. If you did that, we might argue for your reinstatement. Beth got up and walked out. Bob caught up to her at the elevator. He put his arms around Beth. It'll be all right, dear. We have my salary. Beth leaned her body into his. Nothing would stop her from carrying the baby the way she had planned. Bob knew he should be nothing but happy. Wonderful wife, child on the way. Still, Dr. Wilkins' talk of complications scared him. And while Beth seemed delighted with Dr. Pearson, Bob wondered why he took up space with paper copies of books that he could read on a pad. Plus, Pearson's thick glasses gave him an owlish look that didn't inspire Bob's confidence. When Beth got fired, he told her not to worry. But how would they make it on only his income? They'd find a way. No more dinners out. He'd take a bag lunch to work and do more overtime. He'd make that be enough. Bob sometimes wondered why Beth was putting herself through that much trouble, nausea, job loss. But when he saw her patting her growing belly, he knew it was worth it to her. He would never tell her of his doubts. It helped they had found a supportive friend. One day, as Bob and Beth came back from a checkup with Dr. Pearson, they met two women waiting for the apartment house elevator. The younger one was short and skinny in a loose-fitting pink sweatsuit. Her face was streaked with sweat, and her long brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail. She gave them a big smile. Hi, I'm Sandy Mareshi. I just moved into 605. She nodded at the older woman, who smelled of soap and wore a high-necked white sweater under her brown jacket with a brown skirt that came to her ankles. This is my mother. She's helping me move in. I'm Beth Stevens. This is my husband, Bob. We've lived in 908 for about a year. Sandy's smile broadened. It's a really nice building. Bob thought her voice sounded odd, not unpleasant, but high and childlike. As they all got into the elevator, the older woman stared at Beth's belly. You look pregnant. I am. That's foolish of you. Why don't you use a womb farm? Beth practically shouted her response. Why? My womb works fine. Why use a metal tank? Bob wished the elevator would go faster. He glanced at Sandy, who looked like she wanted that too. He noticed how pretty she was. Her eyes were wide but not deep-set. Her chin was elfin, and her jaw was well-defined but light. The older woman's voice grew stern. For your information, womb farms have fewer risks than your old outmoded way. Plus, you're throwing away the chance of genetic enhancements. At the mention of enhancements, Sandy's jaw tightened and her eyes narrowed. Bob wondered why. Beth stared at the older woman. My child is not a science experiment. Mothers and children have bonded for centuries by having the baby grow inside her mom. The older woman's face turned red and her voice rose. My child was conceived without the selfishness of lust and nurtured without foolish risks, and I love my child as much as you'll ever love yours. Beth shouted back. But you wouldn't let her be, would you? She wouldn't grow in you. It had to be a lab. She sneered at the last word. The elevator reached the sixth floor, and Sandy took her mother's arm and practically dragged her away. 
As the elevator doors were closing, they could hear the older woman from down the hall. It's such a step back. Just after dinner, Bob heard a knock on the door. Sandy stood there with a chocolate layer cake. This is an apology cake to make up for how rude my mother was today. Two layers of devil food with fudge icing. Beth smiled. You knew even internal pregnancy people love chocolate. Come on in. Bob brewed coffee and they sat around the dining table talking and eating cake. Sandy asked if they were having a boy or a girl. Beth shook her head. We told our doctor not to tell us. She might be Elizabeth or she might be Mark. I like naming children after their parents. Bob doesn't. Sandy leaned closer to Beth. A great custom, and so is internal pregnancy. I don't see why any woman who could have her baby grow inside her wouldn't do that. Bob heard a wistful note in her voice. It's definitely worth it, even if people don't understand. Beth told Sandy about the firing. That's awful. I can't believe they would get away with that. At least it gives me time to set up the nursery. It's lonely, though. Bob's been working a lot of overtime lately. Sandy's eyes widened. I work from home four days out of five. Maybe we could do lunch sometime. Bob was glad. Beth was alone so much lately with no work to go to and his long hours. Sandy would be good company. Beth and Sandy's lunches together became frequent and often stretched far into the afternoon. One day, it had already started getting dark as they walked back to the apartment building. A group of preteen boys stood on a street corner. A dirty-faced kid in a baseball cap called out, Hey, you so fat! They walked a little faster. The boys started to follow. Another yelled, Why are you hiding that baby? It ugly? Sandy turned to face them. Leave her alone. It's not your business. The tallest boy mimicked her, calling out in a fake voice, Leave her alone. It's not your business. Another boy yelled, That's a freak. Neuter, neuter, neuter. Beth turned and pointed up the street. See that cop car? Run home to your mamas, or they'll take you in. The boys scattered. Sandy took a deep breath. I'm glad you saw the cops. Beth laughed. What cops? Sandy looked up the empty street and laughed too, but she spoke no more until they reached their building. Then she took a deep breath. Beth, maybe I should have told you before, but that boy was right. My body's asexual. For a moment, Beth stared at her friend. Now she could see the asexuality. Sandy's body had no rounding at the breasts and hips. It wasn't a woman's body, more like a little girl who got tall. That was why Sandy always wore loose-fitting clothes. Then Beth saw the uncertainty on her friend's face. Come on, we can talk. The security system scanned Beth's iris and opened the building door. She led her friend upstairs. When they got to Beth's apartment, she took out a bottle of brandy. Want some? It'll help calm you down. I'd love some. Beth poured a healthy dose of brandy into the glass and handed it to Sandy. Sorry I can't join you. I found some pregnant lady advice on an old website, and they say I shouldn't drink. I love how dedicated you are to carrying your baby. It's the way to go. Bob got home and looked a bit surprised to see Sandy there. Beth handed him a glass of brandy. Bob, Sandy wants to talk. Sandy took a big swallow, then began her story. My parents are neo-shakers. They don't believe in having sex and think it's a great blessing that you can have children without sex, and even without reproductive organs. They clone eggs and sperm. My parents had the womb farm delete some genes and block the expression of others, so I never developed those organs. They told me how lucky I was. They guaranteed my purity. Beth remembered Sandy's mother, so cold, so self-righteous. She hugged Sandy. It wasn't your fault. Sandy's voice sounded small and lost. They told me that sexual organs can cause a lot of trouble, sexually transmitted diseases, unplanned conceptions. My grandmother died young of uterine cancer, even though she didn't have a genetic risk. They kept asking, why have body parts you don't need but could cause a problem? The way you are is the next step in evolution. To them, it was all very logical. They wanted me to be pure and safe, like someone in a glass box who can be seen but not touched. Sandy gulped down more brandy. 
She lifted her head and looked directly at them. The tone of her voice grew stronger. I don't want to be asexual. I always identify the female, and I might be able to become more of a woman. Beth put her hand on Sandy's arm. How could you do that? There's an operation that would give me a set of female sex organs. I'd still need a cloned egg and an artificial womb to have a baby, but I could have sex like other women. I need the insurance company to agree to pay for it. They haven't told me yet. Bob got up from his chair. Either way, you're always our friend. Can you stay for dinner? Only hamburgers, but the beef's natural, not synthetic. For the first time that night, Sandy smiled. You would have natural beef. She took a deep breath. Knowing you two means so much. Bob clinked his glass against Sandy's. Here's to friendship. Late that evening, Beth found Bob frowning at his pad. What's up? I googled the operation Sandy once. They call it gender assignment. Not our business, you know. Okay, but I'd never met an asexual before and I was curious about the surgery. It's like the gender confirmation surgery they did for transsexuals before they discovered how to prevent sexual dysphoria. Genetic engineering eliminating diversity again. But it's a lot harder. With gender confirmation, the patient's old sex organs could be used to make the new organs. With Sandy surgery, they couldn't. It's painful and risky. Some people even died. Beth wished her husband would worry less. She needs it, Bob, to feel fully human, able to love another sexually. She has to do it. Bob hated missing Beth's checkups, but he had to work. He was glad Sandy could go with her. When Bob got home, Beth met him at the door with a big kiss. The appointment was great. The doc said everything is fine, didn't he, Sandy? He did say the pregnancy is progressing well. Sandy sounded tentative, and Bob thought she looked concerned. He knew he was. Beth had been getting a lot of bad headaches lately. Beth walked over to the sofa. She moved very slowly. Not only was her belly enormous, but her ankles were swollen. She sat down, then brightened. The baby's kicking me. She pulled her sweater up, and they could see a protrusion from her belly, the baby's foot pressing against her womb. Bob reached out and felt his child's foot through his wife's body. He caught his breath at the thought of new life. Beth leaned back. It's all worth it. It's so worth it. Sandy invited Beth and Bob up for dinner the next day. Beth had a headache in the morning and her ankle swelling worsened. She told Bob not to cancel. She was looking forward to it, but she leaned on him as he knocked on Sandy's door. Bob responded to Sandy's perky hello with a forced smile. I made chocolate mousse for dessert. Sandy took the large bowl he carried. Great, I'll put it in the refrigerator. Have a seat, the chicken and dumplings need a few more minutes. Bob and Beth moved over to Sandy's sofa. Before they could sit down, Beth's body shook. She cried out in pain and collapsed in Bob's arms. Sandy ran back from the kitchen. A share car's downstairs. With Bob on one side and Sandy on the other, they got Beth into the car. Sandy yelled, Northside Hospital, it's an emergency. Hurry! The car's mechanical voice responded, this vehicle must obey all traffic laws. Should I call emergency services? Yes. No. We can get her there faster, ourselves. Start trip. As the car started moving, Bob shouted into his phone, Call Dr. Pearson. In a moment, they heard Pearson's voice. Your call is very important to me. Please leave a number so I can call you back. Emergency alert. This is Bob Stevens. My wife Beth is in pain and we're taking her to Northside. This system will alert me immediately. Sandy directed the car to the ambulance entrance and ignored the robotic voice telling her to move on. Bob got Beth out of the car and a nurse came with a wheelchair. The nurse told Sandy she could only stay if she were immediate family and to tell her car to move at once. They put Beth on a bed in an alcove screened off by white curtains, stuck an IV in her arm and hooked her up to a machine that began to whir and beep. A lot of numbers appeared on the screen. Bob didn't know what any of them meant. Two women in white coats came in. The older one said to the younger, I haven't seen a pregnant woman since medical school, have you? 
The younger one shook her head and looked over at Bob. Mr. Stevens, Dr. Pearson called. He'll be here in about 15 minutes. A man in blue scrubs wheeled in another piece of equipment. I finally found the fetal monitor. He pulled up Beth's sweater and attached two things to her belly. The strong and steady thump of the baby's heartbeat filled the space. Older White Coat said, I want to bring her pressure down. Is labetalol safe in internal pregnancy? Younger White Coat typed something into her pad. No contradictions. Okay, start at one milligram a minute in her IV and see what that does. Bob could do nothing but hope that worked. Blue Scrubs connected something to Beth's IV. Beth clutched her head and moaned in pain. Older White Coat asked what painkillers were safe in internal pregnancy. Younger White Coat held up her pad. Not many that we have. Okay, try Max on the acetaminophen. Blue Scrubs put something else into Beth's IV, and that seemed to help. But her breathing still sounded heavy and labored. She opened her eyes halfway. Bob, you look all blurry. Dr. Pearson is coming, dear. You'll be fine. I can hear the baby's heart. It sounds really strong, doesn't it? Rest now. Don't worry. They'll take care of you. You and the baby. She closed her eyes and didn't open them again. Bob heard the baby's heart slowing. A loudspeaker said, Code Blue, Bay 5, and Blue Scrubs came in with younger White Coat, who was staring at her pad. Turn her on her side and put her on oxygen, 10 LPM to start. Beth didn't respond as Blue Scrubs turned her body and put on an oxygen mask over her face. The baby's heart beat faster, but not as fast as before. They left Bob alone with Beth again. He was covered in a cold sweat. She stayed on her side, motionless and silent. In about an hour, Dr. Pearson came in and nodded to Bob. He looked at the screen, then walked around the bed and stared at Beth. He stepped out for a minute, and Bob could see him in the corridor conferring with two white coats. Pearson came back with blue scrubs. Mr. Stevens, unfortunately your wife needs an emergency C-section. We'll do everything we can for her. The nurse will show you where you can wait. Blue Scrubs led Bob to a waiting room where he sat and stared at the clock on the wall. Why hadn't he insisted that Beth have the baby the usual way, not risk an internal pregnancy? What would his failure cost her, cost their child? Bob sat with his guilt and fear for hours until Blue Scrubs came back. Sir, you have a daughter. Come see her. He led Bob down a long corridor to a room with a small bed where a tiny baby lay adrift in a sea of white linen. Beneath her little pink knit hat, he could see a tiny nose and a chin that looked like Beth's. May I pick her up? Soon, sir, but you better come with me now. They walked a short distance down the corridor to a large room where Beth lay, hooked up to a lot of machines, one of which slowly beeped. Bob quickly went over to her bed. Beth looked so pale as if everything had drained from her. Dr. Pearson and older white scrubs stood on the other side of the bed. Pearson didn't look Bob in the eyes. Mr. Stevens, your wife developed eclampsia. It's a rare complication. Very few women have it, but it's very serious. Very hard. Older white scrubs spoke up. I'm Dr. Jennings. We met in the emergency room. I'm very sorry, but your wife's heart stopped several times during the birth, and before we could restart it, she suffered severe, irreversible brain damage. She can never awaken from this coma, and I have to recommend we withdraw life support. Jennings paused for a long minute, as if waiting for something. Dr. Pearson agrees with this recommendation. Pearson just nodded. Bob reached out and touched his wife's shoulder. I saw our daughter, Beth. She's beautiful. A beautiful little girl looks just like you. Beth made no response, but maybe she had heard him. Bob began to sob. Turn it off. Jennings threw a few switches. The beeping slowed and finally stopped. Bob couldn't call the baby Elizabeth. He named her Angela, his little angel. At home, he watched her sleep in her crib, so peaceful and innocent. She'd never know her mother, but she'd always have him. He brokenly called Beth's parents and his own. He kept the call short. He couldn't deal with their pain now. 
Then he went through the apartment, taking Beth's pictures and throwing them in the drawer. You stupid, stupid, stupid fool. Why couldn't you have a baby like everyone else? You knew the risks. Why did you have to have it your way? The doorbell rang. Sandy stood there holding a pie plate. Pop, I'm so sorry. I called the doctor's office, and the receptionist wasn't supposed to tell me anything. But she started to cry, and she told me, and we'll miss Beth so. And I made you a quiche so you wouldn't have to cook, because you have to take care of the baby. I put ham in it. It's quiche Lorraine. I'm so sorry. She broke into tears. Bob hugged her, and they both clung together until they heard another cry. It was time to feed Angela. At the funeral home, Beth looked peaceful and still in her casket. Bob stood a few feet away from her, dreading that someone would ask him why he'd let her risk internal pregnancy. Sandy was the first friend to arrive. Bob introduced her to his mother-in-law as Beth's closest friend. Sandy expressed regrets, then went over to pray by the casket. Beth's mother whispered, Beth told me about her. She's a neuter, isn't she? Or should I say they? Sandy prefers she, and the better term is asexual. Still, it seems odd she'd have a friend like that, given how Beth liked things natural. Beth wouldn't hold how someone was born against them. Some say it's the next step in evolution. Eventually, everyone will be like that. Maybe they're right. Hard to say things should be natural the way it worked out for Beth. Sandy doesn't think that way. I suppose. She looked at her daughter's casket. If only you and Beth had used a womb farm before you were married, I told her I used one when she was born. Even back then, almost everyone did. She got so mad that I didn't bring it up again. I should have. Her words tore at Bob. Wasn't he the one who should have insisted on a safer pregnancy? Beth's mother walked off to greet some distant cousins, and Sandy came close enough to Bob that their sleeves touched. Bob, you loved Beth. You respected her choices. And that was the right thing to do. Hearing that helped, but he still wondered if he should have done something that would have saved Beth. Bob got a month of paternity leave, and Sandy visited him every day. She joined them when Bob strapped on a baby carrier and took Angela for their first outing, a trip to the grocery store. Bob stared for a minute at a carton of synthetic breast milk before putting it in his cart. Sandy touched his arm. You're thinking of how Beth planned to make her own, aren't you? She was proud of that. No synthetics for our baby, but they've shown it's just as good. Some people even drink it themselves instead of cow's milk. Not me. Angela waved her little arms and gurgled. Sandy stroked her cheek. She looks great. She's doing fine on synthetics. When Bob went back to work, he put Angela in infant care. Sandy visited in the evenings. Angela's grandparents lived far away, so Bob was glad to have someone to share his delight in his daughter's growth. Sandy would lift Angela high in the air. How's my favorite baby? How's my favorite baby? The baby smiled and gurgled happily, and Sandy smiled back. You are doing a wonderful job with Angela, Bob. See how happy she looks? One evening, Sandy came in radiating happiness and carrying a bottle of champagne. Great news! The insurance company will pay for my operation. Let's celebrate. She popped the cork and poured two glasses and proposed a toast. Here's to the new me. Bob clinked his glass against hers. Sandy kept talking rapidly. Before they can do the surgery, they have to prep me with hormones for 14 months. I hate having to wait that long, but no choice. They'll actually perform the operation at Hopkins in Baltimore. It'll take about 10 days. She paused for a minute to catch her breath. He remembered what he had read about the risks of the procedure. Still, Joy lit Sandy's face and he hugged her. So happy for you, Sandy. You wanted it so much. She went on excitedly talking about the treatment. Bob watched bubbles float to the surface of his glass and pop. The next day, they put Angela in a stroller and took a walk in the park. Sandy breathed deeply to fill her lungs with the crisp fall air. Look at those trees, such beautiful reds and yellows. 
Bob's hands were tight on the stroller. Winter soon. Sandy ran one of her hands over his. Why so quiet? The hormone therapy they'll give you can have side effects, like blood clots. Sandy laughed, then grabbed the brim of Bob's baseball cap and pulled it over his eyes. No worry, Bob's. I get tests for that. There'll be lots of effects, but there'll be good ones, too. Her happiness made him forget his worries for a while. Over the next few months, the hormones slowly changed Sandy. Her hair got fuller, her face filled out, her hips widened. Angela changed even faster. Bob called Sandy one day. We want to show you something. Come up for dinner tonight. Great. I'll bring a sweet potato pie for dessert. When Sandy arrived, Bob threw the door wide open to show Angela standing with just one hand on the sofa for support. Sandy handed Bob the pie and clapped. Look who's standing up. She went over and hugged Angela, who laughed in delight. After dinner, Bob put Angela to bed, then returned to see Sandy standing sideways to the mirror looking at her body in silhouette. Do you think I'm getting boobs? No doubt, yeah. They tell me because the hormones started later in life, they'll stay small. Think I should get them enlarged? Bob put a hand on her shoulder and turned her to face him. You'll be beautiful either way. They kissed. Then she backed up a step and put her forefinger to his lips. Not ready yet. Bob wanted to ask Sandy to always eat dinner with him. He needed another adult to talk to. But how would she respond? Then the day Angela took her first independent steps, Sandy asked, Do you think we should share dinners every night? We could split the cooking. Great idea. Let's. Dinner was always at Bob's to make it easier to put Angela to bed. Bob loved having someone he could talk to at every dinner. And Angela was always happy to see Sandy arrive. Her first word was Dada, and her second was San San. One night, as they tidied up in the kitchen after Angela went to bed, Sandy said, Bob, hormone therapy is almost over, and I have to meet with the doctor about the surgery. I'd like someone to go with me. Could you do that? Bob thought again about all the risks of surgery. He tried to keep the uncertainty out of his voice. Sure, Sandy, I'll come with you. Dr. Dalbert's office had none of the old books or musty odor Bob remembered from Dr. Pearson. The doctor sat behind a large desk. His profile turned to Bob and Sandy as he read data from a screen. Finally, he turned to them. Ms. Moreshi, Tess found no reason not to go ahead with the surgery. Still, you need to understand that the operation has the risk of serious complications, and it's quite painful. We'll give you pain blocks, of course, but they will only be partially effective. You could be off your feet for 10 days minimum. She nodded. I understand. Before proceeding, we need you to sign our informed consent form. Please read it carefully and ask me if you have any questions. He pushed the pad toward Sandy. Bob asked if he could see a copy. The doctor looked surprised. Is that all right with you, Ms. Moreshi? Sure. Bob took a second pad from the doctor and read about all the things that might go wrong. Nerve damage, urinary tract blockage, sepsis, death. He heard Sandy saying she'd sign. Bob grabbed her arm. Wait, stop. It says you could die. I know, Bob, but it's rare. The doctor spoke up. There have been some deaths from this procedure, and the risk is never zero. But Ms. Moreshi is young and in fine health. An excellent candidate for... That's what they said about Beth. Sandy asked the doctor to leave the two of them alone for a minute. Once Dalbert left... Bob took a deep breath. Sandy, please, don't risk it. What you are is so great, you don't need to be anything else. You're starting to sound like my mother. Why risk everything? You're taking a step backward. She can't understand. But I want you to. I don't want to lose you. The way you lost Beth. She took a step back, and it killed her. You mean so much to me now. Sandy reached over and took his hand. Bob, I have to do this. I need to be able to love and to be loved the way women can, the way they have since forever. Beth wanted to do things the way women had before, the way women had babies. 
and she took a risk, and she wouldn't have been Beth if she hadn't, and I won't be me if I don't take this one. You respected Beth's choice. Please, respect mine. He could see the yearning in her eyes. But you mean so much to me, so much to Angela, too. Can't you see her smile when she sees you? You are loved now, Sandy, not sexually, but you're loved. I understand. And you and Angela mean a lot to me, too. But I need to be made love, too, to feel a man within me. This operation is the only way that can happen. I know you want that, Sandy, and I'd like to be that man, but it's not worth risking your life. Having you safe means so much more. She gave a half smile. I'd like you to be that man too, Bob. I hope you will be, soon, but there's no life without risk. I've got to try. Bob realized he had no choice but to accept her decision. His arms trembled as he put them around her. After the operation, come back to me. She leaned into his body and returned his embrace. I will. He held her tight and hoped some of her courage would flow into him. Now for the discussion questions. Number one, do you agree with Beth's choice to forgo science and carry her child naturally? Do you support Sandy's decision to use science to change the way she was born? What, if any, is the distinction between the two? Two, is it wrong for science to alter a natural process like childbirth? How is the example in the story different than an incubation chamber for babies born premature? Would you fault Beth for refusing to allow her baby access to an incubation chamber? Three, is Sandy's decision to be made female okay because it is using science to undo what her parents used science to do? Does it matter that the surgery will be painful and risky? Does a person have an inalienable right to gender? 4. Sandy's parents were neo-shakers whose faith demanded the complete absence of sexual intercourse to be closer to God. Is their choice to make Sandy asexual different than child circumcision? And five, should Bob have argued harder against his wife's choice to carry their child naturally or Sandy's decision to become female? What, if anything, is the basis for his argument in each case? You've been listening to A Step Back, written by Henry McFarland. Next week, we'll be reading Christmas in Ushuaia by Helen de Cruz. If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, and listen to our discussions of this and other short stories from our magazine. We will include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage in the comment section or on our Facebook page. Thank you for joining us. And until next time.